to you. Uh, my name is Lou Marinoff. I'm a professor of philosophy at the City College of New York and a longtime contributor to Horasis. Uh, I would like to thank Frank Jurgen Richter very much for assembling this panel. A very interesting panel we have with a very interesting topic, although it uh, does take somewhat uh, of, a, of a back seat to current events in the world, obviously. Nonetheless, in some ways, it's still underscored by them. Uh, our talk today is uh, political correctness. And uh, the, the question is, uh, how, how does political correctness uh, implicate training and development of leadership and obviously business? We're going to endeavor to stay away from politics. That may be difficult, but we're going to try to keep this on a business footing as far as possible and not, not on an ideological footing either. Uh, so as a philosopher, I will probably interject at the end some, some food for thought, but we're going to try and stay on a business footing. Uh, let me, if I may, very briefly, before turning this over to our really interesting panel, uh, basically just a, a very quickly define political correctness so we know what we're talking about. Um, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary says that it, it is conforming uh, to a belief that language and practices which could offend political sensibilities, as in matters of sex or race, etc., should be eliminated or indeed uh, uh, eliminated by means of regulations or penalties if necessary. So uh, this is a pretty severe measure. Its origins come from the, the Bolshevik Revolution. And the West uh, is now, for better or worse, uh, riddled with political correctness in every sector. It started in the universities and it spread to the military, the justice system, throughout the education system, the White House and big business as well. Two quick case studies, just very quickly, because we're focusing on the U.S. today. And I'm going to ask you from your international experiences, please to, to come back and, and, and give us your views in light. Us. Just two quick case studies that deal with business. Gone with the Wind, a wonderful and very famous film, uh, was canceled by the cancel culture a few months ago. It was deemed to be racist because of the role that Hattie McDaniel played in it as Mammy. And uh, she actually was the first African-American to win an Oscar for that award. She won the Best Supporting Actress Award for her role. Nonetheless, the film was deemed racist, racist and so it was canceled by Netflix. The next day, it became number one on Amazon, and Jeff Bezos couldn't ship enough of them. So a conspiracy theorist might want to argue that this was a kind of bait and switch. It was certainly good for in one sense, at least for Jeff Bezos. Second case study, thumbnail sketch. The state of Georgia voting laws were modified recently to require voter ID, uh, since you need in the United States ID to rent a car. A, a hotel room, get on an airplane, or many other things, but you don't need it to vote in every state, and Georgia thought it might be a good idea. Well, the political left uh, deemed this to be voter suppression and therefore racist, and Major League Baseball, in consequence, moved its all-star game from Atlanta, Georgia, to Denver, Colorado, therefore depriving uh, about $50 million of revenues from, you know, from hosting that event, which would have gone to mostly... Uh, African-American minority businesses in the neighborhood, uh, which actually could be viewed as racist. Uh, and it was redistributed instead to Denver, Colorado, which is predominantly white. So this is very peculiar, is it not? Uh, and I would like to have your comments and your feedback and your views on this. So let's go in order. Uh, and first of all, it's a, it's a great privilege to, to introduce each of you. We'll begin alphabetically. Jeffries Brigginshaw, Senior Director, Transatlantic Policy Network, based in the UK. Jeffries, and I gather that you're uh, somewhat of a fan of political correctness in some, in some respects. Please share your thoughts with us. Great. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to pass on the temptation, uh, as exciting as it is, to get into your case studies, which were uh really good to hear um and, and offer a perspective really quickly um I, I don't even think uh political correctness and identity politics is really the core root of corporate action or corporate adoption of the diversity agenda uh, i think there are other and older kind of more binary drivers um distinct ones um the struggle for civil rights equity affirmative action 
Um, I think, secondly, I think the business model acceptance of the case for diversity uh, comes from the delivery of innovation and uh, you know supporting HR hiring practices um, in a war for talent. Um, so in that context, talking about leadership authenticity, I don't think it's a new requirement that leaders need to be authentic. Um, and it's always been true that kind of workers that don't believe in their bosses don't follow them. So I think all we're seeing really in terms of authenticity is a different backdrop and leaders and CEOs having to perform with uh, a different peer group uh, and with uh, a different workforce. Um, and so it's kind of a little bit kind of straightforward in the sense of what they have to show in terms of um, the, the threshold of authenticity. And I just finished by saying, absolutely, this is a process. It's a journey. It's a transition. There are inconsistencies on the way. There are historical legacies uh, and pains that, that get caught up. Um, but I would say, you know, first build confidence um, in communities, whether they're in a workplace or somewhere else, um, to ensure that like bias and discrimination are removed. Um, and, and you can do that, and it's pretty mundane. It's definable, measurable, and manageable. Um, and when you do that, um, move on, um, and you'll find that you're living with a new uh, meritocracy. And the quicker you do step one, the quicker you get back to or move forward to a, a new meritocracy and kind of get rid of the inefficiencies and distortions that in transition, you know, we absolutely do see. Well, thank you very much. I may I may ask one more quick question of you then, if you're since you're speaking of authenticity and certainly uh, one one would want to support that. You did mention meritocracy. I'm not quite clear. Could you could you explain a bit about the difference between the old meritocracy, which seems to be based on merit, and the new meritocracy, which seems to be based on something else? Yeah, I mean, bottom line, like the old city just had us guys, you know, white guys and a few others in it, and the new meritocracy is a broader talent pool. I wish we had more time, Jeffries, to go into detail. We don't, but I, I, I mean, I can't help but respond to you. Uh, part of uh, what political correctness does is to is to uh, disseminate various myths and sacred cows, and it's my job to butcher some of them. One of them is the myth of underrepresentation. You know, there are very good reasons why. Uh, different athletic events, for example, demand different physical characteristics and different morphologies. And there are very good reasons statistically why this might line up in ways which are other than diverse. But as long as uh, U.S. Uh, athletes are bringing home the gold medals, no one seems to complain about a lack of diversity in sports. Uh, I just leave that with you. I mean, I understand that the social arena is, is, is a much more friendly place. And perhaps we'd like to enjoy diversity there for a host of other reasons. I grant you the benefit of the out. Uh, but as a philosopher, I, I just can't help but but try to poke holes in the new meritocracy, if you'll permit me, okay? And forgive me. Uh, we'll come back to you, though, Jeffries, and thank you very much. Uh, next, it's a pleasure to introduce Jack Nasher, founder of Nasher Negotiation Institute, uh, who has an office in New York. Uh, and tell us a little bit about what you negotiate, Jack, and your views on uh, this topic. Well, we support uh, companies in training and, uh, well, in difficult negotiations. And I have to say, from a business pers perspective, I think that political correctness is horrible. Because what we find now in business negotiations that not only, I mean, you know, in a typical negotiation, you have to get the other party to say yes. Otherwise, there is no deal. But now what I find is that in business, uh, and, you know, I never liked political negotiations because you have to... Um, cater to so many stakeholders, uh, to the voters of the one party, to the other party. And then there is something that politicians actually, you know, who are negotiating know that is important, the actual facts. And I say, well, but, you know, you have to understand we have to look good, um, in front of our voters. Now, the same thing is happening in business. So instead of just finding a good, reasonable outcome, now it's about, well, you know, we have to look good because of this and that. I think it's horrible. I think it's terrible, and I also find something that I only observed in politics because I started, uh, in, you know, working for the UN as an assistant attaché, and, and I found that now in business too, you have two worlds. You have the official world, and then people say, "Well, now the cameras are gone, and now we can we can really talk." And it's a very different opinion. We have two 
parallel strings of conversations going on. I don't think that's healthy. I think this ha this is very much resembling uh, not open society. And I think you know we should we should actually be happy that we we live in an open society. But I've never seen that um, that now it's really two different worlds: the public world where we're all afraid of like some the next shitstorm to be victimized by, by some shitstorm. And also companies not supporting their own own people. Once you have an allegation, they kick him out, they kick her out. And I think that's a very, very difficult. To, and, you know, I, because we work a lot with um, with management on different levels, with um, procurement, with sales, you know, you know, it's negotiations. And sometimes with, um, with M and mergers and acquisitions and startups. And I think it's a really a culture of fear. Everyone is afraid to make a mistake. Everyone is afraid that, you know, they could be uh, the target of the next shitstorm. And that really, that's really, really bad for business. And I also find that smaller companies, you know, we work a lot in Germany. That's, um, you know, that's, that's, we, we have an office in Munich. And in Germany, it's, I, I notice that it's the smaller companies um, that are still uh, led by, by the founder. You know, they don't care that much. But the Fortune 500 companies, there's so many, so much bullshit happening. They're wasting so many resources on trying to be correct. But I think really in the long run, it will hurt them a lot. I think it's a, it's a very, it's a horrible mistake. Well, thank you for your sincerity. And uh, I mean, I would say that your characterization is virtually word for word what the historian Medvedev wrote about the former Soviet Union under Stalin, where people were basically terrified to appear to, to, to fail to conform to a system of lies. Uh, and that and that's what it amounts to. And it cannot but hamper productivity and performance if there are really two systems, the one we pretend to uphold and the one we really need to uphold in order to do business. And if that's what you're experiencing, I can tell you it started in the universities and it spread everywhere from there. So I'm very sympathetic. Um, and also for, for some other strange reason, it's much worse in the Anglophone nations. Uh, the, the, the nations, I mean, all of the EU is politically correct now, but the worst of it in recent years in the pandemic, which we haven't mentioned yet, has, exa has exacerbated this, yes? Because if you look at Canada, uh, Australia, uh, UK, America, uh, New Zealand, these were formerly the freest of the free in terms of freedom of speech and expression and so forth. They're now the least free of the free. Uh, so it's it is not good for business. I'm sure it can't be. I totally agree, and I see that. I, I see that there is a super fear, and uh, even when I get, you know I, I teach, I see, teach for Stanford University um, and for for German universities, and sometimes you have complaints from students because uh, they're offended by something where you think, what you know, what the hell, what was that? And uh, so th there's some like thing where it's it's really hard to actually even understand what they're talking about. So no, this is getting ridiculous because now you have to say, well, sorry if somebody's offended by this and that. And I, and I agree, but it's it's coming, it's spreading all through the world, unfortunately. And I yeah, think it's, it's, it's the quiet majority. And that is, you know, business, uh, obviously, uh, as well, has, has its role that, that, you know, you shouldn't shouldn't play along uh, and, and just shouldn't accept that. Because really, free society and a true free speech is something we should really value and, and, uh, and support. And we support the people. Uh, our people, you know, and not just uh, get rid of them on the because because of fear. Very interesting. We'll, we'll come back to you uh, on this, okay? And we'll we'll take it a little bit further. We're going to complete this first round. Uh, and next, I, I'd like to introduce Phil von Schubert, who is the executive chairman of InFrontier, uh, who's also operating uh, out of the United Kingdom at the moment, but actually does a lot of work, I gather, in Afghanistan. So, Felix, please uh, give us your preliminary thoughts on this. Thanks very much. And, you know, this already sounds like a good and lively discussion, which is uh, which is fantastic on this all male panel, if I may say so. Um, so, look, well, so, yeah. So what? I mean, just the point that it's all male, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Look, my, my point and I'm going to contradict uh, some of you, if, if I may, otherwise it won't be interesting anyway. My view is slightly different. My view is political correctness first and foremost is an education tool. It is for us to understand um, what we're talking about. You know, if you call uh, Native Americans Indians, means you probably haven't really looked into your history books. Let me just take a very plain and simple example. And I think there are many examples like that, that if we use the correct terminology, 
it makes you start thinking. It makes you start looking into your history books. It makes you more inclusive just by using different terms. And I think that's a very important thing and helps business to open up, to open up markets and to understand what's going on around just the narrow mindedness of whoever the CEO might be or the head of sales or something else. So, so let me ask you, let me ask, let me add a a second point, if I may. Please go ahead. Uh, Louis just mentioned I'm active in in Afghanistan and uh, I, it's true. I run a fund that focuses on investments in Afghanistan. I've been doing so for the last eight years. uh, And obviously life has not become that much easier over the last nine months, but we're continuing and we've got a portfolio. We've got over a thousand employees on the ground. I've spent many, many weeks uh, on the ground, um, obviously, since the Taliban are there, much less so. But what I want to say in that regard is that when you operate in a culturally very different environment, if you're not culturally aware, and I would add if you're not politically correct based on local customs and, and understanding, you have no chance of being successful in business. And I think that is probably true in many different countries. But I guess, but I guess uh, Afghanistan is sort of an ex- extreme example where you need to probably jump over your own uh, shadow and think, okay, what's the correct terminology here? How do I correctly address somebody? Do I shake hands or not? With whom do I shake hands? These might be sort of cultural sensitivities, but there's also cultural, uh, there's also political correctness about it. A lot of Americans, we're talking about America that I have encountered in business in Afghanistan, talk about the people, all these Afghanis, they're doing this, that, and the other. You may know that Afghani is the name of the currency, not of the people. It is sort of simple examples where, you know, some might call it political correctness. I actually call it, uh, you know, maybe cultural awareness. Yeah, but that's that you know, true in many, many. Nobody would disagree with you, but I, I don't think that's what you know we talk about when we mean political correctness. I well, think well, disagree I, with I disagree. Mean, I disagree, okay. if I may. And uh, in the German a, language, it, in the it's one, great one that you disagree, gentlemen. It's great that you disagree, and it, it's clear. I think the ground of the disagreement is clear. I wanted just to turn the tables on you, Felix. Because you're speaking about uh, about activity to culture, and certainly no one in his right mind would would disagree with you that if you want to do business in a different culture, it's very helpful to know something about the norms of that culture and to respect them. And whether it's Japan or Afghanistan or Brazil, and we'll come to you, Charles, in a moment. But but, but this is not political correctness. This is more like common sense. I think that political correctness in this case, you know, referring to your uh, your example about the Indians, uh, is that the Washington Redskins, which were uh, which was an NFL football team and a you know major force in that league, big business, big business. Uh, they they had to change their name to the Washington football team because people took great offense at their use of an Indian name. Whereas the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, named after uh, Indian chiefs, are perfectly entitled to keep that name because the local people have no no quarrel with it, including the Indians who are honored by the by the adoption of Indian terms by a major sports uh, industry, thinking, well, this is paying homage to them. So my question to you, Felix, is what is, who is going to dictate what we call them this week? I mean, you know, this is what is wrong with political correctness, because what you call them weak might be sanctioned. And if you make the mistake of not noticing that next week they're ha- they have to be called by a different name, like First Nations or Aboriginal peoples or Indians or whatever the term is that's sanctioned by the political powers, you could lose your job and your career by making a simple unintended verbal mistake. And that's politics interfering. I think, with business. So what's your response to that, please? Okay, my response is a specific example coming out of the German language. Jack will know that. Um, In German, we tend to determine everybody's job description by the male job description, not by the female job description. So by default, you just exclude 50% plus of the population when you talk about a certain job description, be it a politician or whatever else. And, you know, a few years ago, people realized maybe that's actually a pretty stupid idea to exclude half the population just in the language that we use. And now people are starting to use either a neutral term or a term that includes both genders. You know, is that a stupid idea to do? Maybe not. Maybe it's actually quite a good idea. And back to business, 
maybe being inclusive and political correctness in this case means means inclusivity you know opens up a huge market because guess what if people get offended they might not want to buy your products i might <laughs> okay. go somewhere else understood that's back to business i like during the focus to business and if everything gets politicized too much then consumers stay away as they did with with some major league sports so it, it can cut both ways but thank you for the observation charles thank you for your patience i'd like to introduce charles tang president of the brazil chamber of commerce and industry you've got a very interesting personal history charles knowledge of china uh, as well as knowledge of brazil and america so please give us your Your thoughts on this topic. Uh, unmute yourself, please, Charles. Okay. Yes. Sorry for that. Uh, well, I'm very pleased to see you again, Lou, and meet the uh, my colleagues in the panel. Uh, you. We've discussed now, up to now, we've talked about gender, racial, and cultural political correctness. I like to add that uh, in today's day, there is another very strong pressure of political correctness for most business leaders, which is the environment. Everybody wants to go green, and everybody should go green. There is enormous political correctness pressure on business leaders to go green. So I have been focusing mostly on this type of political correctness, gender and cultural political correctness. You know, I have, <clears throat> I fully understand what you're saying because you know I I've, I've worked and lived in seven countries, so you know each culture is different. You know, and you have to act according to the culture where you are. But uh, as the president of the Brazilian Association of Waste Energy and Hydrogen, we are focusing a lot on transforming waste into energy. You know, transforming a tremendous pollution and very high cost pollution, because today in Brazil there are no There's only one commercial scale waste to energy plant. And Brazil will become one of the major exporters of green hydrogen. Not only because of the 5,517 municipalities that do not have waste to energy plants, and Brazil being a major agricultural country, the only part of the that is utilized agricultural waste for energy to be recycled into energy is the bagasse from the sugar cane, the waste from the sugar cane. The rest of the soybeans and crops and corn, they're plowed under or burnt. So in order to meet our uh, target for lower emission and the climate change, to prevent climate change, so that our sons and grandsons can have a world to live in. I think one of the major pressures of political correctness that many of the business leaders are following is to go green. And that really is my focus uh, more than cultural or racial or gender. Okay, that's all fine, Charles. Let me ask you this then, to be once again the uh, provocateur. Uh, we're well aware that environmentalism is a kind of new global religion and that anyone who questions the science of climate change in any way is deemed a heretic and therefore likely to be canceled, including some Nobel laureates who challenge this, but you can't get funded unless you tow the ICPP party line. That much we understand. But is it not it the case that Brazil at the same time is slashing and burning the rainforest of the Amazon basin, which is one of the great treasures of the world. Uh, and surely it's a folly to be doing this. Wouldn't you agree? I agree 100%. And, you know, unfortunately, different governments have different ideologies. In this case, it's an ideological question, okay, in the, in the president of Brazil. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, it is 
being slashed and burnt, like you said, because that is the policy of the present government. To, yeah, but let uh, me just I, let's you know bring it back to the to the topic of uh, of real political correctness. And I think you know I, I totally agree with you, uh, with you guys, all of you. I think we have very different ideas of, of political correctness, basically. The way you know, I, and I think that you know what 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 you meant by initially is the fact that there are some things you cannot say, uh, some things b because you're afraid to offend them, uh, some things you're not you know even about. It's it's very odd now that uh, everyone you know has the same opinion pretty much, and once you say something against the opinion that is, you know the the, the main the major opinion. I mean, right now in, in Germany, for example, one week ago. Um, there were people marching against the uh, corona measures, okay? And police were stopping them, saying, well, you know, you're not 1.5 meters, uh, the distance is just not sufficient, it's too dangerous. Now you have demonstrations against Russia, against Russia, 150,000 people in Berlin, and nobody talks about corona anymore. They're all standing next, forming a chain, and it's fine. It's absolutely fine. And I think now, you know, if, if you talked about that now, that would be a problem. Right. Um, so you, you have the, or another example, the singer Anna Netrebko, uh, who is a world class opera singer, was suspended in Munich and she was now suspended in New York from the, Metro, the Metropolitan Opera because she doesn't distance herself. She's supposed to say I'm, it's horrible uh, and it's, it's terrible, even though she's obviously not part of the Putin administration or a soldier. And yet she has to say certain things. I think that's what we mean by real political correctness. That you have to be. Uh, say something or not say something, and you know. And I'd be interested in your thoughts about about that. I, I think uh, you know th that Lou, uh, w would you agree that this is like the 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 political correct correctness we we want to discuss? Well, I'm supposed to be the moderator, uh, and it's probably a good thing that I'm just the moderator, uh, and and very interested in having uh, one of the things we're able to do on this panel. Take note, and it's really partly to your point, Jack is that we're able to air our disagreements as well as our agreements. It's not required in a civilized world that everybody agrees with each other. But the whole point of civilization, surely, is to be able to have an informed debate and an open dialogue on the issues on which we disagree, with a view eventually to achieving some kind of consensus, perhaps, or agreeing to disagree. But we don't have to have bloodshed because we disagree, and we don't have to imprison people unjustly or count heads and, and observe some Marxist quota system to prove we have a utopia going on around us. Those are the things that you obviously uh, don't like, and, and neither do I. But before yeah. I give you the bottom line, and I will, I would like to come back to our other mm -hmm. panelists and have another quick round. Okay, we have 15 minutes. Uh, so could, could you please give us your further thoughts? Let's go back to Jeffrey's. Um, what, what, if any, are your further thoughts on this topic? Would you like to leave us with something as a kind of a, as a kind of a takeaway, or a, sure. a, you know, well, please do. So, so Lou, I think the bottom line is that the world that that you describe in, in that world, some people are just not too scared to talk in that world, and we want to hear their voices. Um, and from a business point of view, we want to hire some of them because they might be smart. And we're just not talking at the moment, so we need to listen and we need to include them. And that's about Felix and what we said about inclusiveness. But listen, I'm not here, and I don't believe that any of us or many people want to kind of say that the silly extremes of cancel culture are a kind of path to the perfect future. They're not. But listen, to have the courage to push back against those extremes, you need business leaders need, we need credibility to push back. That credibility to push back at the silly extremes comes from delivering on a track record that puts people in jobs, uh, listens to voices that have a different perspective um, and includes, just as Felix said. And when you do that, you can be sure that people will give you the time of day to say, listen, you know what? We don't have to really decide how many angels can dance on the head of this particular thing today. Um, let's move on. And people will listen to you when you say that. But you have to deliver um, a new meritocracy before people will listen to you. 
That's wonderful, wonderfully put. And I know that you've read all those books in your bookshelf behind you and more, unlike the talking heads who are sermonizing at us, who have curated backdrops now uh, with a lot of books they haven't read. So I, I really appreciate that. That's uh, that's a sincere view. And I wish we had more time to discuss the nuances of uh, the distinction between the old and the new meritocracies. I think that's a very fruitful line. Maybe we'll get Frank to convene a panel on that uh, in the near future. All right. So let, let me pass on Jack. Jack, I know you're full of, uh, of enthusiasm and energy on this topic, and I share many of your views, but would you like to give us one more blast uh, from Munich? What, what, what would you like to, to leave us with as a kind of a parting well, shot? Yeah, I wish it were a new meritocracy. I think it's, it's exactly the opposite uh, that is happening. It has nothing to do with merits, but with group identity. Um, I think that the idea of diversity is per being perverted because diversity means people look differently, but they all think the same. And if you don't, you will be punished. Um, I also think that, you know, there should be a right not only to disagree, there should be a right to dislike other people, to, you know, even hate other people and to exclaim it. And, you know, Milton Friedman, and I'm sure not everybody uh, loves Milton Friedman, I'm, I'm fully aware of that. But he said, well, if a, a company decides not to employ a certain minority, whatever, deaf, African-Americans, well, fine for them, but they will pay a tax because they will, uh, you know, they, they will not hire people who are actually qualified. So they will pay for that. And why not let them do that? So I think, you know, these are also interesting thoughts, I think, that at least are worth discussing. But I think that, and I absolutely agree with you, Lou, that we should discuss them. And I think that's, that's the toying with ideas. And that is, I think, something that, that we're losing, uh, that we're losing right now. And I see that in negotiations because that's my job, that uh, the corridor of agreement is getting narrower and narrower. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, is, um, you know, dismissing lots of options. And I also noticed that people working for larger companies are bec becoming less and less loyal because they know that their superiors won't back them up. Uh, if there is a tiny mis a disagreement of if, if they're being attacked, they know they won't be backed up. And I think that is uh, that is really hurting business, huge businesses a lot. And I think it's particularly true with for, with larger companies. Well, and if it's bad for business in the sense that you're describing it, uh, I can assure you that it's been bad for education in exactly the same sense that there's no scope anymore for debate on campuses, for heaven's sake. And it's bad for science, too. And science is also business, because if we're going to politicize science, then we're not going to allow open ended inquiry. We're going to have, you know, these gerrymandered uh, outcome oriented research projects, which is a euphemism for finding evidence to support the hypothesis we politically want to support, even if it's absolutely lame. So I don't see this as being any different from what you describe in every sector. And in the end, it could. I'm just saying could. Uh, imperil our civilization if it gets out of hand. Uh, that That's a pretty strong statement. Uh, okay, Felix, on that happy note, uh, what would you like to offer us as a, as a kind of a food for thought, please? You'd be disappointed, Lou. I won't fully contradict you this time around. Um, look, I think we need to differentiate between these two things. One, cancel culture in the term I think us five think we may understand it is a risk to free speech and therefore a risk to development of intellectual abilities, science and everything else. In Germany, as well as in the UK, we have no laws against cancel culture at universities. Quite interesting. In the UK, very recently, in Hamburg University, just implemented after they had a very uh, sort of controversial professor put back in place. Um, and, you know, was supposed to be cancelled by a whole lot of students. They put a law against that cancellation in place and let him speak and teach. So interesting, there's a bit of fight back there. But I think where we need to be very careful is how do we achieve inclusion so we don't leave half the population or at least certain groups of the population behind, as we have done over the last decades in all of our respective countries. That is something we need to think about and we need to be honest about ourselves. In the UK, a good chunk of the population is being left behind because their parents can't afford the most expensive education. That's ridiculous and it's being leaving people behind and therefore loss of economic power. My last uh, comment is on 
fake news. And I think we need to be very careful just because we're saying cancel culture may not be a good idea and let everybody say whatever they like does not mean that fake news should be distributed freely. It doesn't help. I don't, I don't think we should go there. And I think you know, if Trump believes that he had more supporters at his gathering despite obvious photographic evidence right in front of your eyes, that's not right and you need to speak out against it. If Putin says this is not a war but something different, you have to speak out about it. And I think that's true in many different uh, uh, instances. And the Brazilian example, you know, the fact that the environment minister of Brazil is a highly corrupt individual who's selling the rights to burn down trees, got to speak out about it, even, you know, when that is clear and obvious and, uh, and, uh, f and has foundation. So we need to be very careful to differentiate. Um, we can't accept any type of fake news. We need to fight fake news. As on the other hand, we need to fight cancel culture when it prohibits intellectual uh, fights that we need. Well, thank you very much. I think your, your remarks are, are well measured and well conceived. And I wish again we had more time now to ask a more difficult question. How can we tell the difference between real news and fake news? This is not so obvious either, but uh, I'll leave it there. I think that you're a very serious person who's thought about these issues. And I really appreciate what you've just said. Charles, um, I'm going to ask you again, please give us your sort of takeaway or your, your, your final food for thought on this topic from your unique perspective in Brazil via seven other countries. Please uh, share your wisdom with us. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't think I, Jack should basically concentrate only on labor negotiations as being uh, the pressure of political correctness. I think there are many aspects, like Felix is concentrating on culture. Uh, I'm concentrating on, on the climate change. And, uh, you know, there are many pressures facing today's business leaders to be political correct in many aspects in the racial aspect, in the gender aspect, in labor negotiations aspect, and how to deal with the uh, labor unions and, and cultural differences. And of course, uh, to me, a, mo a very important issue is the climate change. So I think that uh, today's business leaders in the major companies face a lot of political correctness pressure in various sectors, okay? And I was just watching the uh, panel about will United States survive the next election when we talk about fake news, okay? <laughs> so that's a different topic, so I'll just stop there. Yeah, the good place to stop before we get on to that. But, uh, you know, with respect to climate change, I, I, I can't help but observe that we're in a real pickle if there are things we really need to do on the one hand. But on the other, we know the climate has been changing ever since there was a climate and that natural effects play a role in this. The big question scientifically is exactly how and where are humans causing observable changes? What can we do about that? I definitely agree, but not politicize it. And if the two biggest polluters potentially are not coming to the global meetings, then what can we do about that? You know, this is a more difficult question, surely. But thank you very much. Gentlemen, I want to leave you with a thought, if I may. And Jack, you may you may appreciate this. The others, well, we, we have our differences, but may I say this to you? I've been censored, too, in the U.S., although the First Amendment obviously allows me some latitude. I teach in a public university, and therefore I'm less susceptible. But I must tell you this, that for 30 years I've been trying to promote a remedy for political correctness because I really think cancel culture is just where it goes when it's not nipped in the bud. Uh, political correctness is the thin end of the wedge. Cancel culture is what happens when it metastasizes, and then we're ruled by howling mobs who are propagandized by fake news, whatever that may mean to you. But the cure is really simple. Uh, it involves a distinction between offense and harm. In any civilized society, I hope you will agree that in a civilized society, you have a right not to be harmed. And if someone inflicts a harm on you, 
then there is a remedy for that harm. There's a justice system. There ought to be there ought to be a remedy that the harm doers eventually are brought to justice and pay the price to society for inflicting harms. We certainly don't want people harming each other. Uh, but offense is something that you have to be willing to take. You know, a harm can be inflicted on you against your will, but an offense is something that you take. And if we condition a bunch of people to run around seeking to take offense at things, then we are empowering them to punish people because of their own states of mind. And I submit to you, this is the fundamental distinction between offense and harm, that when you're harmed, you're an unwilling victim of harm. When you're offended, you are willing to take offense. And that what happens is with political correctness, and I'll finish that and then ask each of you for a 30 second response. The political correctness makes me responsible for your state for everybody else's state of mind except your own that's why people are afraid jack because because they're afraid that someone's not going to like what they say so therefore that person becomes responsible for their state of mind that's a kind of insanity where everyone's held responsible for everybody else's state of mind and not for their own gentlemen you're responsible for your state of mind at the end of the day and i hope you don't allow anyone to hijack it that, that, that's the bottom line. If we teach people the distinction between offense and harm, then they'll realize that they can take offense or not, but that we can have free speech and we can have truths being told and not to worry so much. Sorry to sermonize, but I think it's a philosophical point that's been neglected. Okay, let's go around. We have four minutes. Each of you, could you give us your 30 second takeaway and, and then we'll call it a day. And, and thank you very much indeed. Jeffrey's back to you, please. So I would just finish by saying I think there's a really good business case for encouraging diversity in the workplace um, because it delivers innovation and happy in included people. Um, the poli political correctness and extremes of cancel culture pretty much have got um, not much to do with the building of that uh, kind of solid business case. Um, and it's worth pursuing to uh, the new meritocracy. Okay, so I mean, you're you are able to, in your mind, dissociate diversity from political correctness. You want to uphold diversity as a virtue, and uh, and therefore yeah, you lack, think of, it's... lack of courage to push back, but you need credibility through delivery to push back. Yeah, fair enough. We don't want people left behind uh, unjustly, and I certainly would agree. But thank you for that insight, uh, Jack. Your 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 final thoughts on this, please. Uh, I think we have to uh, understand that an open society is not necessarily a polite society, that we have to be ready to be challenged, especially in the university. That's the whole idea of education is to be challenged and not feel comfortable at all. But you, you have to uh, face new ideas because new ideas lead to innovation. New ideas lead to uh, progress. And that is the case with companies. So talking about business, I think we'll very clearly see that those companies who are not led by this, uh, you know, political correctness, but who are brave and who support their people and are loyal to their people, um, even if they're sometimes, you know, offending people. So, so what? That's that's the idea of the open society. We have to. We, we don't have the truth. We don't. We never know if we reach the truth or the best way. And I think that really the we will see that those who don't um, who don't work with a super political correctness will be much more successful. I think it's, no, it's, we will see. That's a great good. hypothesis, Jack. And let's see how it plays out in reality. Thank you very much indeed, Felix. Any final thoughts from you, please? No, I would. I would love to agree with you uh, on the offending idea. You know, let's offend each other, and you know, as long as people can fight back, that's right. Leads to innovation. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, there are groups of people who can't defend themselves, who haven't got the means, who haven't got the abilities, who may have been discriminated, even made illegal in you know, only 20, 30 years ago, many societies. Then to then say, look, they shouldn't, you know, shouldn't, you know, make such a fuss and, you know, go to court if you feel offended. Um, no problem. That doesn't work until we have reached a different level of justice and recognition, I think. So I'd love to agree with you, but I don't think we're there yet. We are not yet there. Why? Because the society isn't just enough. All right. Well, thank you very much. If you think justice can be therefore imposed on us in order to allow us to speak freely, that, that's a debate for another panel. But I appreciate your candor and also can certainly share your thirst for justice, whatever that may mean. Charles, 30 second takeaway, please. OK. Yeah. Again, I want to focus on what Felix said, 
the world is unjust and many people cannot defend themselves. And uh, also the cultural aspect of political correctness is very important. I have seen major projects go under because the people, business leaders from one country don't really understand the culture of another country. And, you know, major projects with a lot of money being lost because some business leaders don't understand the cultural culture of other countries. So as, that's basically what I would like to as, as, as Yes, as, as uh, Felix had pointed out earlier, you know, at the beginning. So thank you very much, Charles. We are out of time, gentlemen. My only regret is that we don't have more time to pursue the nuances of the differences between us. But I greatly appreciate your contributions today. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And I hope to meet you uh, on a future Harasses panel and hopefully in person. So good, good day, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye for now. I'm going to stop the streaming.